Good afternoon everybody and thanks for coming. Today's lecture I'm going to discuss uh, in the broadest sense some of the science that's happening in uh, Bristol's chemistry department in regards to uh, drug discovery and finding new treatments for disease. Okay. Uh, what I'd like to do first though is to start with a story. This is Claire. It's 1952, and as you can see, Claire is very pregnant. Okay. Uh, she's having a really tough time of it. And she goes to her doctor, and she says, Doctor, please, you have to help me. It's not just morning sickness. I'm being sick all the time. Okay, it's morning, it's noon, it's night time. I'm, I'm restless, my joints are sore. I'm vomiting, it's really not pleasant. And the doctor says, Claire, today is your lucky day. Because this morning, I had uh, a company rep in from a pharmaceutical company telling me about a new drug. It's called Distaval. Okay? And it's a mild sedative. It's meant for people in exactly your condition who uh, are nauseated or morning sickness or whatever, but it's perfectly safe. Okay, he showed me this advert for it. Okay, uh, this this little child. If if that had been the normal sort of opiate sedative that I would have prescribed, that child would have died uh, because because its opiates are far too toxic. This, on the other hand, is really really safe. Uh, so Claire takes her prescription, she says, thank you doctor, and she goes away, and nine months later she has her baby, and her baby's born without any arms or any legs. I want you to imagine that it's 1962, in 1960 rather, and you're a pediatrician. Over the last eight years you've seen a massive increase in the number of children born with deformities such as Claire's babies. Okay. You've seen a massive increase in the number of miscarriages, a massive increase in, in the number of children that die in the first couple of years of their life because of the deformities that they're suffering. And nobody can work out why. Until in 1960, an Australian doctor writes in the Lancet Medical Journal I've been going through the patient's uh, notes and the mother's notes and all of them have been prescribed Distaval in the early stages of their pregnancy to cope with morning sickness. It doesn't take long for the scientific community to start to get more and more evidence to confirm this doctor's hypothesis that it was Distaval that was responsible for these birth defects. Uh, you may well have heard this story before okay. um, and heard of Distaval not by its uh, uh, commercial name but its trade name, Thalidomide. Okay. Um, the British government in unusual um, rapidity banned this within about a year of the initial publication of the risk. Okay. So really quite rapid action from the British government. Okay. Some countries were slower though and the company that was selling it took advantage of that and basically kept selling Thalidomide up until late 1963 when Brazil, the last country in the world to ban it, did so. Some really quite frightening statistics that about 20% of all children born after taking thalidomide actually show abnormalities of some description. 60% infant mortality rate. Okay, that's children dying within the first two years of life. Okay. Largely because things like uh, heart and things like that don't develop properly because of the 
And there's about 10,000 victims of it living today. Now, why am I telling you this story? Well, let's make two points really. Firstly, society needs new drugs. Not just for curing cancer uh, and AIDS and all the high, big high profile diseases, but also to improve people's life. Okay? To help people like Claire with, with her morning sickness to cope better and to improve the quality of people's lives. So society needs new drugs. Well, as we see from those uh, from the thalidomide story, those, si those drugs that we come up with must be effective, so they've got to do what we want them to do. They must be safe, okay, and they must be economical for us to produce. And that's where we as chemists come in. Okay? This sub-discipline of chemistry and medicinal chemistry has a singular aim and that is to discover new drugs. It does it by trying to develop or discover molecules that will bind selectively to what's called a target. Now that's normally a protein in your body or in, for instance, a bacterial cell that you might be targeting for, for an antibacterial agent. Okay. So some sort of protein normally. And through binding to that target elicits some sort of pharmacological response. Okay. So we get a drug. But it's obviously got to do that, get a useful effect from that, and to do it safely. Uh, in 2000, uh, to much uh, publicity around the world, uh, Bill Clinton and Tony Blair joint joint press conference, uh, conference, London and Washington, announced the publication of the first draft of the human genome. Okay. Decades of research culminating in a blueprint for what our genes encode as a human being. Okay. Now the publication of that came with a promise. And it's a promise that we've heard many times in history. Okay. That by learning more about biology, learning more about what it means to be human, both in terms of anatomy or through to the molecular sciences as today, that by learning more, we'd be able to tackle disease in a much more effective way. That we'd be able to find treatments faster, more effectively, cheaper. There's a problem with that. And it's not really proven to be the case in the problems. Here's the problem. It's called been nicknamed in the literature recently is Aaron's Law. Okay. Uh, many of you will be aware of Moore's Law in computer programming, which basically looks at the speed of computer processors, okay, the number of transistors they have. And it's, Moore's Law says every two years, uh, computers will get faster. Double the number of processors you can put on a chip, the computers get faster. And it's held pretty solidly for the last um, 40 years. It's a brilliant plan. Okay, so that's Moore's law. Erum's law is the quality of that in the pharmaceutical industry where as time goes on everything gets slower, we, uh, we find fewer drugs, it takes us longer to do it, it costs us more money. So this is the graph from 1950s looking at number of drugs we find per, per billion dollars. Okay? And you can see the amount of money goes down cliff. Okay. There's two reasons for this or two sides to this graph. Firstly, it's getting harder for us to find new drugs. Fifteen years ago, 
we found, as, as pharmaceutical industry as a whole, found 52 new drugs in a year. Okay, think about that. That's, that's about one a week. Okay? Absolutely fantastic productivity. Compare that with last year, where it was 15. Okay, we've gone from one a week 15 years ago to a little bit over one a month. Okay? So it's got really harder, much harder for us to discover new drugs. Okay? At the same time, the price has gone up massively. Okay? So how much does it cost? Okay? I like to see some hands, please. So I've got three numbers here, $175 million, $800 million, or $12 billion. Okay? Okay, who thinks it's 175? Stick up your hand. Okay, quite a few takers for that. Who thinks it's 800 billion dollars? 800 million, sorry, dollars. Okay, about a similar sort of number. And 12 billion, very few takers for that. The truth is, is that all these numbers have an element of truth to them. Okay? Uh, 175 million dollar figure comes from a paper a year or so ago, where they tried to estimate the cost of developing a new drug if nothing went wrong. So if you started today, I'm going to discover a drug for whatever, and you synthesized the new drug, and found a new drug, took it through clinical trials of testing it in humans, and it went straight to market, the figure was about 175 million. Now, there's a lot of criticism of that number that it's probably a bit low, but uh, it'll do for us as a starting point. $800 million, that's a slightly older figure, okay? and what that tries to calculate effectively is the industry average cost per drug. Okay? So, for all these ones that are successful at this $175 million, there's a whole slew of things that go wrong. Uh, don't work. Okay? As a result of that, your drug that you've just discovered here has to pay for all those things that go wrong as well. That very expensive drug discovery effort that you've made on, on other projects. Okay. And then there's this 12 billion one. Well, this, is, this comes from this year, an article in Forbes magazine, where they took what pharmaceutical companies have declared on their R&D spending, and divided it by the number of drugs that they found. Okay? And 12 billion is how much on average AstraZeneca uh, paid for their drug discovery effort. Okay? So an industry average, but within that industry average, there are companies doing much better and much worse than other companies. Okay? So very expensive and very poor productivity, and it's getting harder. The big question, why? Why on earth would that be the case? Well, there's lots of reasons, okay? Uh, some people will say it'll be management structures within companies. Some will say that actually the drugs that we found in the 60s and 70s were the easy ones, so the low hanging fruit and now we're stuck trying to discover drugs for the difficult stuff. Okay, it's certainly a lot of truth to that. But there's also been a tendency for us to think in, in terms of a disconnect between pharmacology and the drug discovery process. What I mean by that is, in the 50s, or early drug discovery efforts were based on stuff that you knew worked, whether it's a uh, plant or herbal remedy or things like that. Okay, so you started from a pharmacologically knowledgeable position um, and then moved forward. Okay, that's not really the case anymore. Okay. So lots of reasons on why this problem arises. So this lectures about the big ideas. Okay, but really it's not about the big ideas at all. At least that's. No, not directly. It's really about the big questions. Okay? And I'm gonna there are lots of questions that we can ask today, but I'm only gonna touch on three of them okay, in our time. Okay, the first one is 
is what proteins should we target? How do we pick? Why is it so difficult to pick something in the first place? And how do we pick a, a, a protein that we might target? Okay, the next one is where can we find new drugs? Okay, are we going to look down the back of the sofa? Or can we use biological information okay, to help us design new drugs? Okay. So let's have a look at the first one. What proteins should we target? Okay. And it's easy for this guy picking his target. It's straight in front of him. Okay. But it's not the case in a drug discovery effort where you are an incredibly, incredibly complicated series of chemical reactions. Okay. Now we've approached understanding you and picking a, a, trying to decide, decide on a target in a very regimented fashion. We have tried to simplify. Okay. Now, you're all happy with this approach. No doubt it's come up in, in your, your A-level studies at the moment, okay? The scientists, in order to try to understand what's going on in a particular system, try to simplify it, try to reduce it down into its component parts and then work out what's going on. The assumption being that the component part behaves in isolation in the same way that it does in the more complicated system, okay? And that reductionist approach has been incredibly useful to scientists. Okay, not just chemists, but all branches of science have taken this reductionist approach to um, scientific problems. But it turns out that some things are a bit too complicated. Life is complicated. Um, we've got lots of a jumble of wires here, and it's a bit of an analogy to how your body works, okay? If I started to pull, or if you started to pull on one of these wires, okay, you don't just affect that one wire, okay? You start tugging away, the whole lot will move, and it moves and it behaves in ways that you cannot predict, okay? And life is like that, your cells are like that, okay? So you have not just one protein in isolation doing what it wants to do. That protein will interact with other proteins. That protein will produce, perhaps catalyze a reaction, the, the, the product of which might go on to have a, another effect within the cell. So you have all this interconnectedness and scientists have been trying to deal in recent years with that complexity, that connectivity. And it's become, in, in a biological context, known as it's a shift in paradigm okay, to what's called systems biology, where we stop trying to think of everything in isolation and instead look at how things behave as a whole. How are things connected? This, as you can imagine, taking a reductionist approach is, is complicated enough. Trying to deal with everything all at once, that's very difficult. Okay. And that's what we try to do. We try to live with that complexity. Here is, um, you could consider it a map. Okay? Each one of these little dots is a human protein. Okay? Every one of the lines okay, is a predicted or experimentally derived connection between those proteins. Okay? And the length of the line is obviously how connected they are. So you see that actually everything basically lies in the middle because everything's connected, everything's really on top of each other. Okay. What's that got to do with chemistry? Okay. Well, the tools for uh, pulling this apart are chemical tools. Okay. 
we develop chemical methods in order to separate both individual proteins and the connectivities between the uh, individual proteins, the, the small molecules that they might interact with, the other proteins they might interact with, the DNA, the nucleic acids, to try to pull these together. The idea is to try to find uh, not just effective drugs but safer drugs. We want to minimize the disruption that we're going to cause in a biological network. We want to pick targets which will have the effect that we want and be able to cure our disease or tackle our uh, nausea or whatever. Okay. And the tools for all that are chemical tools. So that's part of what About where can we find new drugs? Well, obviously we're synthetic or we're chemists, so some of us will go out and try to chemically synthesize to make from scratch a new drug. Okay. We might approach that in, in a quite different way, you know, ways. We could either think about synthesizing one individual compound at a time or entire libraries of compounds at millions at a time. There's lots of those technologies that are floating around. Okay. Uh, but what if there was another way? What if instead of making it ourselves, we found drugs from a different source? Maybe an ancient source, one that we've turned to time and time again in human history. Yes, drugs from nature. Okay. Now, we get a lot of our medicines from nature, okay? from bacteria, from fungi, from plants, and even from animals. Okay? So we get a lot of our drugs from there. Okay? Can we use that to find new ones? Okay? Let's have a look at a story. Okay? Here's probably the most famous of the world here is Alexander Fleming. Uh, Alexander's got a, he's a doctor, but he's got a bit of a sideline. He's quite interested in uh, bacterial infections. Okay? Uh, in fact, his, his medical career is focused on treating sexually transmitted diseases. Okay? Uh, and he's, the, there's the early, uh, antibacterial compounds are really just starting to permeate onto the market. They're ridiculously toxic, they're not very pleasant to take, the sulfur drugs mainly, okay, but it gives them something. So he's actually one of the first people in the country to start prescribing these early, highly toxic antibiotics. This feeds through into his research interests. He has this plan, he has this great idea, which is well, there's bacteria everywhere, okay? Um, there's bacteria on the bench, on our clothes, in the air we breathe. But the thing is, is we don't get sick that often, okay? And his hypothesis was that there is something in our mucus, okay? Nasal mucus, the back of our throats, the mucus, the earwax, okay? So his, his hypothesis was, Let's look for something antibacterial agent in, in this mucus. So he's taking swabs of his nose and things like that, and he's smearing it on agar plates, which is just basically food for bugs, for bacteria, and uh, seeing if these can stop the growth of any bacteria. He goes on holiday, and you know what it's like just before you go on holiday, okay? There's this mad, Mad panic, okay, have I got my passport? Oh, where did I put my uh, keys? Uh, have I packed my socks? <sighs> and, and, he's, and he's running around like a mad thing, and he's got all his experiments running, and he says, I'm not going to deal with it. I'm going to leave all this until I get back, okay? 
Who here has gone on holiday and not done the tidy? Yes, we've all been guilty of that. Okay. So Alex had their comes back and he's tidying up. He's, he's had a lovely holiday. He comes back and he starts throwing stuff away. Um, but he notices something. He notices that on one of his plates, he's got a fungus growing. Just a fungus from air that's landed on the plate. Okay. But around that fungus, nothing else is growing. Okay. The fungus appears to be making something that is killing all the bacteria. Okay. Uh, Alexander goes away and he makes, he grows more of this fungus up and he makes a, a crude extract of it uh, which appears to contain this, this antibacterial agent. Okay. And he calls this extract mold juice. Okay. Uh, he's not a chemist so he, he didn't have the skills to work out what was inside it. What we know nowadays is he managed to stumble upon the first of the penicillin antibiotics, penicillin G. Okay. The G, I only learned this recently, the G stands for gold standard. It was his best extract. Okay. His penicillin gold, gold standard extract. Absolutely fantastic. Okay. So this is it. Okay. And what this does is it stops um, bacteria from making their cell walls properly. And in the process, will kill them. Okay, because stuff leaks out. Okay, so that's penicillin. Okay. But it's not just the penicillin. In fact, 70% of all our drugs are derived, or our natural products are derived from natural products. 70% of them. Okay. And it goes better because actually nearly all our antibiotics and all our anti-cancer compounds are derived, our natural products or are derived from them. Why would that be the case? Well, it is because bacteria, because life is in a constant state of chemical warfare. Whether it's bacteria against fungi or, or plants against bacteria, Okay, constant chemical warfare between the two. Okay, imagine you are a plant and you do not want to have a fungal infection. What do you do? You evolve over thousands of years the ability to make an antifungal compound. How about if you're a bacteria? You want to secure this lovely new source of food that you've found. Well, you can produce an antibiotic to kill any other bacteria that might want to come along and eat that food. Therefore, you secure the food for yourself and therefore you can reproduce and go on to make new generations. So, there's constant chemical warfare between species and organisms. Uh, as a chemist, I always roll my eyes every time I read Oh, this contains the goodness of nature on the side of a packet of, of something. Okay? The most toxic, the most deadly, the most carcinogenic compounds all come from nature. Okay? Let's compare two of, of basically one of the Botox, okay? um, botulinum toxin. Yes, exactly the same stuff that they will inject into people's foreheads if you're crazy and you want to look like um, John Travolta. Okay? Uh, Botox is 250,000 times more toxic than VX nerve gas. Okay? 250,000 times more toxic. Uh, it's an illustration. I'm going to challenge people to eat the, one of the world's most toxic compounds. When you get home, you can do this. Please don't kill yourself. Okay. Uh, blue cheese. Okay. Uh, the blue is the penicillium rock for. Okay. Uh, and that makes penicillium uh, that makes rock fourteen. Okay. Uh, which is one of the most toxic compounds known to man. Okay. It's there in absolutely tiny concentration, so you're you're perfectly safe. And there is only one 
case of, of somebody dying from it, actually it wasn't a person, it was a dog, who'd happened, a restaurant had cleared out a lot of old blue cheese, and the poor dog had come along, he'd been quite hungry, he ate the blue cheese, and promptly died. Okay. Um, so, nature isn't good. Nature is violent, toxic, carcinogenic, really not that pleasant. Okay. I'd rather have one milligram of VX nerve gas than take one milligram of Botox. Okay. Now there's a problem to look into nature for antibiotics. Can anybody work it out? Okay, the problem is in drug resistance. Okay. Uh, as we've used antibiotics, uh, more and more drugs, uh, more and more species have become resistant to the drugs. Okay. And one of the main reasons for that is because if we're taking a, a, pro a natural product as a new antibiotic, well, obviously the species that we got it from has to be resistant from, to it in the first place. It has to be. Okay. And bacteria have this magical trick where they can share genetic information between one another. So over time, we accumulate this ability to be resistant to drugs. Okay. How long do you think it took for... This isn't a new problem. This isn't a new problem. I know it's got a lot of press in the last few years, but it's not a new problem. How long do you think it took for drug resistance to become apparent against penicillin antibiotics? We started using them in 1940. When do we think we, we are? A few years later. Absolutely. By about 43, 44, we'd already started to see cases of of drug-resistant penicillin strains. Okay. Massive, massive problem. Okay. Um, who last year had their um, World Health Day focused on drug resistance? That's what the posters are. They highlighted things like a lack of research. But if it costs nearly a billion pound dollars to find a new drug, okay. How inclined are you a firm, to be a pharmaceutical company to invest in a new antibiotic if you know that in a few years' time it's going to be obsolete because of drug resistance? Okay, so lack of basic research. No commitment, so not finishing a course of antibiotics, so you might feel better, but there'll be bacteria in your gut or whatever that's still um, happy, okay? And they, they're now a little bit more tolerant to the antibiotics that you take it. Weak surveillance, so one for the doctors picking up on the diseases in the first place. Poor drug quality, okay. irrational drug use, okay. running to your doctor when you've got the cold and asking for antibiotics. The cold is a virus, antibiotics won't touch it, okay. but people will take it for the sort of placebo effect, okay. thinking they're doing something. Okay. So irrational drug use, please don't do that. Um, no infection control, so if you have one person sick, then if you don't isolate them from other people, then it spreads amongst the other people. So those are the points that, that you picked up on. Uh, we've not found a new class of broad-spectrum antibiotic in 10 years. In fact, we've only found, I think it's two in the last 30. Okay. There are probably not the the new wonder antibiotics coming over the over the horizon anytime soon. So we really need to conserve the antibiotic activity that we have already. Okay. So how can we get more out of this? And some of the stuff that's happening in Bristol is, is trying to focus on these. So we obviously try to isolate new compounds from uh, from natural sources mainly bacteria and fungi and that kind of stuff. Uh, we try to understand how these compounds are made, okay, so that we can either uh, adapt them, okay, both chemically and also come along and actually manipulate the fungi and bacteria to try to get them to make 
new compounds for us. And these strategies do prove to be quite successful. Okay. Our last big question was basically we're getting all this biological information, whether it's genome or protein structures or whatever, can we use that in order to design new therapeutics? Uh, the answer to that is a yes. Okay. Uh, I'm going to show you one example, but it's one example of, of many approaches that are, are, uh, are rising in, in the last few years. And uh, I think I think this is a very strong growth area in fermentation. Okay. Um, so I'd like to talk to you briefly about structure-based drug discovery. Okay. That's where base chemists or, or my colleagues in biochemistry will try to solve the structure of a protein. Okay. It's not just biochemists that do that, chemists also do that. Okay. And then use that structure to guide their drug discovery efforts. Okay. Here is um, a protein called IGF-2, insulin growth factor 2, or rather insulin-like growth factor 2. And its job is uh, normally to help growth and development of during gestation, so of a child inside the womb. But as you get older, there's a chance that you'll pick up mutations in the gene that codes for IGF-2. So, uh, and these mutant proteins can then go on and wreak havoc. In fact, quite a, a large proportion of, of cancers involve uh, mutations to this IGF-2. And one of the reasons for that is IGF-2 is uh, it's a growth hormone, effectively. And what it does is it promotes the growth of your tumour. Okay? So it makes it grow faster than the other tissues that are around it. Now your body mops up IGF-2 normally. Okay? It has this protein here, it's IGF-2 receptor. Okay? Um, now this will come along and it will bind really, really tightly onto IGF-2. So can we use, can we find out structural information between IGF-2 and IGF-2 receptor and use that information to, as a treatment? So could you give somebody an injection of a, a drug or perhaps even the whole protein itself um, in order to mop up this excess IGF-2 and to help tackle these, these tumour growth. Okay. Well, it turns out you can. Okay. Uh, what uh, colleagues at Bristol have managed to do is work out the structural information of the complex between IGF-2 and this receptor. And then with colleagues in, in Cambridge, I've been able to put those information together to develop a series of peptides and, and uh, therapeutics to mop up this excess IGF-2. So it's at a very early stage, but it's actually proving to be a very successful strategy. So we're taking that structural information and then using uh, our understanding of biology and chemistry to try to develop a therapy. There are some lessons for us. First of those lessons is life is not simple. Science isn't simple. And we, is, uh, we have to learn to embrace complexity. Okay? It turns out that if anything is really important to us, then it's complex and we have to tackle it with that complexity in mind. We have knock-on effects that we have to think about. Secondly, we should work with nature. Nature's been doing this whole, in a scientific context, nature's been doing this drug discovery stuff for a lot longer than we have. Okay? There's a lot of things we can learn from nature. Secondly, thirdly, it's all about perspective, the way we have to look at things. We can start to look at the world through one single perspective, but we will always learn more about the world 
by taking multiple perspectives and thinking about problems, challenging problems, requires us not to just look with a singular perspective but to take in as many perspectives as possible. And the fourth and final one is collaborate. Okay. All these projects involve multiple different research groups. Uh, many based in chemistry but some are based in um, other universities and other departments within universities. Okay. One person in this, in this new complex world of science that we find ourselves in, one person cannot know everything, cannot do everything. Okay? And the only way you can tackle big problems is by working together, collaborate. Any questions? Thanks very much. It's been a pleasure.